If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, let's open them up to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 is where we're going to launch out of this morning. Uh, you can open a hardback black Bible that you'll find under every chair. Acts chapter 1 is on page 909. Uh, you can open a phone or a tablet, uh, though I don't think they're good for your brain as I preach from a tablet. Okay, um, but Acts chapter 1 is where we're going to be. Uh, so just by way of knowledge, especially if you're a, a guest with us or, or uh, you, you maybe just come back from Christmas breaks, college students, good to see some of you. Um, uh, we are doing, in the last week and this week, we're doing a weird thing for us here at Fathom, which is a two-week topical mini-series uh, on the vision of our church. Uh, that's, that's what we're doing for these last two weeks. And I just need to let you know, who was here last Sunday, second service? Okay, let's just buy a show of hands. You weren't in second service. You were in first service. You were in second service. Um, I got home. On Sundays, I get home after church, and I open up my laptop, and I plug in the video card and the audio card, and I start to process the video and the audio podcast and all that. And I was sitting on my church, and as I processed the podcast, I saw that it said one hour and three minutes. And I thought... Something's wrong with my computer. Uh, no, it was not my computer. I preached for one hour and three minutes last week, and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> uh, I felt embarrassed, and I will try not to do that this week, but I'm already off to a bad start because that wasn't in my notes either. Uh, so <laughs> we'll see how this goes, but welcome to Fathom. Uh, just so you know, we normally don't do these topical series. We normally, I mean, 90% of the time, we're walking through books of the Bible, preaching through the text chapter by chapter. And so uh, if you're a little underwhelmed by today, I guess Get it? That's fine. Come back next Sunday because next Sunday we're starting our spring series in the book of 2 Samuel. You already saw that flash up there, but there you go. 2 Samuel is where we're going to spend all spring, uh, and it starts with some weird stuff, which is what we like from our Old Testament, right? We like weird stuff, and then we try and figure out what that means. And so Saul is dead. All right, we'll see you next week. We'll see you next week. Come for that, it'll be enjoyable. Uh, but hey, we'll get into that next week. This week we're talking vision. And, 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 and last week I spent an exorbitant amount of time talking about two words that you can see on this banner over here, go deep. Go deep. That's all I did last week was talk about the vision of Fathom. And half of our vision is that we exist to go deep. But a vision statement for a church, and really I would say for most organizations, is trying to answer the question, what does it look like? Like what, uh, a mission statement is what is the church about? The vision statement is what does the church look like? And so we're trying to explain in these two sermons, what does Fathom Church look like? And last week I essentially said that it looks like a church that's going deep with Jesus. It's about going deep, but that's only half of our vision statement because there's a second banner over here and it says reach wide. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about reach wide. Go deep and reach wide are the kind of like the two pieces to the vision of Fathom Church. And last week we started uh, in Matthew chapter 28 in the Great Commission, right? Where we talked about the Great Commission that Jesus gave to his apostles and to the church, which the, the mission of the church is to make disciples. That's what the Great Commission teaches. But today we're starting in Acts chapter 1 because Acts chapter 1 kind of pairs with Matthew chapter 28 in that we are getting the very last words of Jesus to the church before he ascends to sit at the right hand of the Father. That's what we find in Acts chapter 1. And so look at your text with me. We're going to look at verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, this pair is really important to the, the, the Matthew 28 Great Commission passage. So, Matt, so uh, Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power. Now, the you there is a plural you. It's a y'all. That's what that is. That's what that you is. And he's talking to the church. Jesus is addressing his followers, the church. And he says, but you uh, will be filled. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
So Acts 1-8 pairs with Matthew 28, 19 and 20 real nicely uh, in that it's kind of the reach wide thing. It's, it's the charge to the church to reach out beyond their borders. And so it says, uh, you will be my witnesses. You will witness to other people about me. You will be my witnesses, Jesus witnesses to Jerusalem. So that's, he's in Jerusalem when he's saying this. So he's saying, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna witness to me right here, like in your hometown where we are. Uh, but then he says, Judea and Samaria. So those are the surrounding regions. So he says, yeah, you're gonna witness to me here, but you're also gonna witness to me out there in surrounding areas. And then he just throws this one in for good measure to the end of the earth, to the very end of the earth. That, that includes everything. Like the ends of the earth includes everything. And by the way, that's how we got here. You are the ends of the earth. We are the ends of the earth. They, they would never have dreamed 2000 years ago that we'd be sitting here like this today. But that's the mission of the church is that we go to the ends of the earth. So go deep, yes, but reach wide. That's the second half of our vision statement. Now, uh, I do want to quickly myth bust real quick before we jump too deeply into this because we've got two banners, go deep, reach wide. We kind of talk about them in two movements at some level, but these, uh, we, we, we cannot emphasize this strongly enough. These two things cannot actually be separated. This, theologically, you can't do go deep without reaching wide. And you can't reach wide without first deepening yourself in Christ. So theologically, you cannot have one without the other. And Christians notoriously, even churches, have tried to separate these things out and be about one without being about the other. Historically, this has happened. Uh, there are some doctrinally sound and robust churches where they know all the right things and they say all the right things and they profess all the right things, but when the rubber meets the road, they ain't doing anything. They're doing zilch. And listen, that's not faithful to the Bible. That's bad theology in practice. Just so you know, Jesus has all kinds of harsh words for religiously elite people who neglect the least and the lost. If you think you can just go deep and not ever have to worry about anybody outside of your going deep, you're out of alignment with what Jesus taught. But on the counter side of that, on the other side of the spectrum, there are people in churches who are all about reaching wide, like missions and, and doing stuff. They feed the hungry and they clothe the naked and they love the immigrant, uh, but they don't care a lick for good theology. They don't care about right belief or sometimes even right behavior as long as the mission is happening. As long as, you know, those things are happening, as long as social justice is being pursued, then that that's what the church is supposed to be about. It's just going and reaching people just reaching and caring and serving. And I'm, and I'm just telling you, both sides of the spectrum are wrong. Like both ends of that spectrum are problematic because in the New Testament church, as God's people went deep, as they went deep, God always added to their number and the church grew. There was always a missional edge to their discipleship. Okay, and so I, I, I don't think it's because the Lord just miraculously started like filling chairs and filling seats in these first century churches. What I think happened is as the church went deep, the way the Bible lays it out, it compelled them to reach wide and it was attractive to the point that people said, I wanna be a part of that thing too. At great risk to their life, to their relationships, to their livelihood, goodness. I mean, it cost a lot to be a Christian and the movement exploded. It exploded. So the leaders of Fathom Church have said, this is our vision, go deep and reach wide. But we've also kind of expounded upon that. And that's what we've been preaching on last week and this week. So here's movement one. I'll put it up on the screens. This was last week, hour and three minutes. Here's what we said. We are a community of believers in Jesus Christ who invite and welcome all people to discover and deepen their relationship with God through the study of and submission to God's word, responding in a life of worship unto him 
and living faithfully in a biblical community with one another. So, so, so that's what we talked about. That was all last week. It's all on YouTube, an hour and three minutes. You don't have to watch football today. You could watch that. I mean, it'd be awesome. I, no one's gonna do that, okay? But um, that's go deep. But that's only half of our statement. Here's the second half. With an emphasis on equipping our people for ministry inside and outside the church, we reach wide to join on God's mission by sharing the gospel and demonstrating his love to our neighbors, to our city, and to the ends of the earth. So that's sentence two of our vision statement here at Fathom. What does Fathom look like? This is what we aspire to, and this is what we think the church looks like. So what we're gonna do today is all the same as we did last week. We're just gonna walk through this point by point with the second sentence. So here we go. With an emphasis on equipping our people for ministry inside and outside the church. Equipping our people for ministry is ripped straight out of Ephesians chapter four. So we preached through Ephesians last fall, and in Ephesians 4, Paul says that that God gives churches, local churches, different types of leaders. Leaders in these categories, apostles and prophets, evangelists and shepherds and teachers. And that, that God gives leaders to churches with the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. So what Ephesians 4 essentially means, and I preached a whole sermon on it, it's less than an hour and three minutes, so you can go enjoy that. Uh, but, But what this means is that God gives leaders to churches. God doesn't give churches to leaders. God gives leaders to churches. He gives the church leaders in a lot of different categories, but those leaders aren't meant to be the primary doers of ministry. That's not what we're meant to do. We, as leaders of the church, are meant to primarily be equippers of you for ministry that God has for you to do. So that's my job. My job is not to kind of do everything around here. Now you pay me, I do some stuff. Like I get how that works. But like my job primarily is to equip you to do the stuff. That's really what I'm supposed to be doing. That's my job. That's Kyle's job. That's Amanda's job and Aubrey's job and the intern's job. We pay them zero dollars to do that. Should triple their salary for that, right? Like, that's what the elders are supposed to do. We're not just making decisions. We're supposed to equip our people, the saints. That's you. Call grandma. Tell her you're a saint. Your pastor just told you you're a saint. Okay, equip the saints for ministry. That's what the job is. So we ripped that right out of Ephesians 4. Now the question is, okay, so what does that mean? How does that look? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which we preached on like five years ago, uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, we find out about the topic of spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts. And the way that I define the idea of a spiritual gift is this. A spiritual gift is any ability empowered by the Spirit for the edification of the church. That's a spiritual gift, and there's tons of them. There's lists in the Bible, but they're not comprehensive. It's any ability that the Spirit uses for the building up of his church. That's what a spiritual gift is. So uh, when a person gets saved, when a person becomes a born-again Christian, when you receive Christ and surrender your life to him, God ransom and redeems not just you as a person, not just you individually, but also he ransom and redeems every talent, every ability, every gift set. He takes all of those things, things that you're good at, like things that you were born good at, things that you've worked at your whole life to get good at, your personality traits, the markers and skills that you just kind of have intrinsically. He takes all of those things and when you get saved, he takes those talents, he empowers those talents with the Holy Spirit to use them for the building of his kingdom. That's the idea of spiritual gifts. And so I was thinking about this a little bit. Uh, Joel, our intern, who we pay well, uh, he, he preached a couple, two, three weeks ago. Did you listen to this guy preach, by the way? Yeah, bro can preach. We should triple his salary. I mean, it's like, thank, thank the Lord for these guys who we can have come and preach. And I'm thankful for it. I mean, really thankful for you, bro. But, but he was preaching on Peter 
right? The, 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 talk, the talk was on Peter's denial of Christ. And uh, I, if you've been around Fathom for a minute, you know that I historically have been really hard on Peter. I'm not very nice to Peter, like in my sermons, because he's an easy target, okay? He's just real easy. And I gotta be careful, okay? Because someday I'm gonna meet Peter, right? Someday I'm gonna see him face to face and I don't want him to like, I'll turn and like sneak attack, punch me in the neck or something like that. I don't know if you're allowed to do that at the pearly gates or not, but Peter might be, like he might have me in his sights. Um, but, but I'm thinking about Peter as you're preaching on Peter and, and something struck me. Uh, I make fun of Peter a lot, but, but you, ever, you ever say something dumb? No? Okay, one person who's a liar and then the rest of you are honest. No, yeah, yeah. You ever, I mean, just... Like, some, like you open your mouth and out pours something that was, you know, not well thought out or totally inappropriate or ridiculous or dumb. And it just kind of cascades out of your mouth. And you're just like, I wish I could gather that back up in there and shut it. You know, you ever do that? You give me a face mic for two hours a week. I do it all the time. I do it all the time. Live stream it too. So that's uh, un, unsmart. Uh, but that's good. That one will go down in the, someone's going to, someone's going to send me something that's like, hey, way to be unsmart today. (laughs) Well, our boy, Peter, just so you know, if you've read the Bible, he is the starting quarterback on the varsity squad of saying dumb things. You just, just read the Bible. He is in there doing it all the time. We talked about this this summer, the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember this story? Jesus, James, John, Peter, go up on the top of the mountain. Jesus starts glowing. Moses shows up. He starts glowing. Elijah shows up. He starts glowing. And Peter thinks to myself, you know what I should do? I should speak. <laughs> Here's what he says. Okay, Luke 9, 33. As the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we are here. Let's make some tents. Let's make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. The Bible, the inspired, holy writ, it it lets us know, hey, give the guy a break. He didn't even know what he was talking about. (laughs) Recorded, that's recorded for us. The Bible's like, this guy doesn't know. Can you imagine the scene? I mean, literally, Jesus is transfigured. He is glowing. Uh, Moses, dead. Elijah, dead. They rise up from the, the ground and like are glowing, talking amongst themselves. And Peter speaks up and his words are, it's really good to be here. And you got to imagine James and John are just like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Like right now, seriously, shut it, Peter. Like I got to imagine that's what's going on in that moment. He just, he, he's, a, he's the leader of this team saying dumb things. He does it again, okay? Remember, remember when Jesus uh, is forced to rebuke Peter um, for suggesting that he didn't need to go to the cross? Remember this? And then what did he call Peter? Yeah, he called him Satan. Bad news when when Jesus, the master calls you the devil, just not great, right? That's not a good one. Um, Also, there's one that's lesser known that I was thinking about this week. Do you ever think Peter is like up in heaven cringing and maybe the other, the other apostles bring up like the last supper? I wonder if he ever is just like, Hey, don't bring that up again. But they just keep bringing it up because they're like, Hey, remember after dinner when Jesus like took the towel and was going to wash our feet and you said, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus said, you got to have your feet washed by me if you want a part of me. And then you said, well, then don't wash my feet. Like, just give me a bath. Remember when you asked Jesus for a bath? That was bad. (laughs) You think for all eternity, he's just a little embarrassed up in eternity for that. I, I don't know. But then, but then we just read Acts 1. But in Acts chapter 2, on the day Peter receives the Holy Spirit, we call it the day of Pentecost. On that day, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit and he uses the very thing that he got in trouble with all through the gospels, his mouth to preach the first sermon in church history and 3,000 people become Christians that day. The very thing he was getting in trouble for is the thing that infused with God's spirit is used for the mission of the church. That's being equipped I'm not saying you're going to save 3,000 people with your big mouth. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But that's what we talk about when we mean equipping. All of us, every single one of us has gifts 
And you are called to use those gifts to play a part in God's kingdom. Spiritual gifts are for every believer, not for some elite state of believer. Every single Christian has a gift. At least one, you've got a spiritual gift. No believer has them all. There's not like the Rocky Balboa who's just gonna fight off the Russians with his spiritual gifts. No, we're all in this fight. And we're at a, we're, we, this is a church, we're a small church. This is a church where we're not paying pros to do everything. This is the kind of church where no one in this church gets to ride the bench. We need everybody in the game. And this is why we talk about serve teams. This is why I've got a little quarter sheet on every chair today. We need you. If this is your home church and you're not serving and you want to serve, fill that thing out. Get active in this place. We want, if you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, fill that thing out and leave it blank and we'll follow up with you. We'll talk with you. Like, what are you good at? Listen, if you can't sing, we're not giving you a mic. You know why? It's bad for us. And it's bad for you. It does us no good to feed delusions of grandeur in here. We want to know what you're good at. We want to empower you to use those gifts to build up and edify the church. That's equipping. With an emphasis on equipping our people for ministry inside and outside the church. Next, we reach wide to join on God's mission. We're going to talk about the mission of God. This is a largely misunderstood doctrine in Christianity. Uh, And so we are gonna talk about the mission of God. Now, last week, remember Matthew 28, we talked about the church's mission. And the church's mission is to make disciples, to make disciples of Jesus Christ, baptize them, teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. That's the church's co-mission with God the Father. But that mission is part of the larger mission of God. Okay, now, if you are doing the Bible reading plan with Fathom, or maybe you're doing another Bible reading plan, most likely you've just read Genesis. You most likely have just read the first book of the Bible. And in Genesis chapter 12, verses one through three, we find one of the preeminent texts on God's mission in this world. I'll put it up on the screen and read it for you. Genesis 12, one through three says this. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Abram would later be renamed Abraham, but that's who we're talking about. Father Abraham had some sons, okay? Uh, And many sons had Father Abraham. Okay, I know who went to Awanas. Uh, Now, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant. And what that means is that God chooses Abraham One man, one family out of all the peoples on the earth, he chooses Abraham and he calls him to step out in faith, to trust God. And his promise is to make him a great nation and to bless him with then the purpose of blessing all the families of the earth through him. So Abraham, we're not gonna just make you into a big old family and bless you just for your sake. It's ultimately for a larger mission to bless all the families of the earth through him. Now, back to Acts 1.8. Back to Acts 1.8. It says this. We've already read it. I'll read it again. But you, the church, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So in Genesis 12, God says, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth through you. Like, the ends of the earth, all the families of this earth through you, Abraham. And then in Acts 1.8, Jesus says, hey, I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit, fill you with the spirit and power my church. And you're gonna be my witnesses now to the ends of the earth. So what happened in Genesis 12 carries on and continues through God's church, through the church. The mission of God is ours. It's not just Abraham's. It's not just Hebrew people, Jews. It is for the church to continue to reach all the ends of the earth. God chooses people. You and I, he's chosen us. He's called us to believe in him through faith. And then his promise is to bless to the very ends of the earth 
through us. So I, listen, I, I mean, this is important. When, when God saved you, it wasn't just about you. Gosh, a whole lot of Christians seem to think that it was just about getting them to heaven. But that's not the only thing that Jesus died on the cross for. That's not the only part was just getting you so that eternity wouldn't be in the hot place, but it'd be in the heavenly place. He, he did this so that through the church, the ends of the earth would be reached. All tribes, all tongues, every knee bowing before the throne. He has a purpose for you, and that is to join on his mission. Now, real quick, we have to also do a little bit of term work here because we have to be careful. Uh, there is a difference between mission and missions. Got to be careful because people miss these uh, and mix them up, and they're not the same thing. So uh, here's the quick definition. Mission is all that God is doing. It's everything that God is doing in his great purpose of the whole of creation to redeem and reconcile all things. And it's what we get to participate in. We get to cooperate in, but the mission of God is extensive. It's huge. It's this huge umbrella overshadowing everything. That's mission. But missions are the multitude of activities that God's people can participate in by means of, of actually furthering the mission of God. So you following me there? Mission is the whole thing. Missions is our part to play in the whole thing. And there's hundreds, thousands, millions of ways to do missions, but there's one mission and that's God's mission. Now, how do we do that at Fathom? How do we join on God's mission? We reach wide to join on God's mission by sharing the gospel and demonstrating his love. Two categories, we share and we demonstrate. Again, two things that cannot be separated, that must be united. One does not work without the other. You must share and demonstrate. Now, when I became a Christian about 20 years ago, I was in high, uh, more than 20 years, goodness, more than 20 years ago, I became a Christian in high school. And the demonstrate thing was kind of a big fad in the late 90s. I don't know why it was, but like the demonstrate thing was, was like a fad, but it was a weird fad. Uh, uh, follow me here. I'm not sure if this is still a thing that's going around. Maybe it still is. But, but in the 90s, you would wear a T-shirt with like a hoaxy saying on it as part of your evangelistic prowess. I don't know if you've, are there still like just bad Christian T-shirts out there? Okay, uh, maybe it's a thing still. When I, in the 90s, you, it's like you got saved, you got baptized, you got a T-shirt. And the t-shirt said something like this. Uh, it was like a, a logo that, that, that was for Reese's candy. But instead of Reese's, it said Jesus. Like he'll fill your appetite or something like that. And it's just like, ugh, you know, I had it, okay. Uh, late 90s, late, late, late 1900s, um, uh, there was a store called Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, I don't know, uh, is it back? Somebody told me it was back after first service. All I know is it smelled like heaven as you passed it in the mall. Um, but Abercrombie & Fitch was kind of the big deal clothing when I was in high school, but Christians weren't supposed to wear Abercrombie & Fitch. And so there was a shirt that said, a breadcrumb and fish. Uh, right? I mean, this is like the thing. And it, was, and it, was, it wasn't just t-shirts, but it was just this weird kind of hoaxy thing. Like you would, you would wear your WWJD bracelet or you would uh, you know, put a Jesus fish on your bumper sticker of your car. Or when you, when you turned 18, you got a cross tattoo, okay? So like guilty, all right? I was in, I had the t-shirt, I had the cross, I had the bumper sticker. I was kind of in this and no shade to any of those things. I don't want to cast any shade on those things uh, except for the t-shirts, okay? <laughs> Please don't do that. But um, but the philosophy behind those things was this. When I put this t-shirt on, this is my testimony. This is how I witness 
for Christ. People are going to see this shirt or my bumper sticker when I cut them off in traffic or my tattoo, and they're going to ask me about it, and I'm going to get to share Christ with them. That was the, the idea behind those things. Here was my big problem. The big problem was no one asked me about my t-shirt except for other Christians looking to get a dumb t-shirt for themselves. I never had a conversation once with anybody unsaved. I think they just cringed. It was cringeworthy before that was even a thing, okay? That's how it was. So it was all based in this quote from St. Francis, uh, which says this, you probably heard this. Preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. You've heard this? Preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Two problems with that quote. First, there's no record that St. Francis ever actually said it. I think they just attributed it to him so it sounded smart. Second problem with that quote, that quote is dumb. It's just dumb, guys. It's just not good theology. I understand the sentiment that you should live, like you should demonstrate, you should preach the gospel in how you act and behave. Yes and amen. We demonstrate God's love. That's right there, okay? But it is absolutely necessary that you use your words, We share. We share about the hope that we have in Christ. I don't need to convince you. Paul will convince you in Romans chapter 10 when he says this. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And he's not talking about what I'm doing right now in like the actual act of face mic preaching. He's talking about Christians sharing about Jesus to non-Christians. How are they gonna believe if they don't hear? TikTok, you know, 15 second videos? You think that's sound doctrine? Orthodoxy on those little scrollers? No, you need to share Jesus with people. As a Christian, it is absolutely necessary that we share the hope we have in Christ. So gosh, I make fun of those t-shirts, but I kind of miss when we had t-shirts and we're trying than when we took those t-shirts off and stopped trying altogether. So maybe bring back the t-shirts, I don't know. Or open your mouth. And I know that's hard and I know that's scary, but that's what it means to follow Jesus. So joining on God's mission means, yes, you demonstrate God's love in what you do and you share God's love in what you say, both, both. Well, pastor, where am I supposed to do that? Like, how do I demonstrate and share? Where am I supposed to do this? Like, should I go on a missions trip? Like, what do you want me to do? I'm so glad you asked in that voice, okay? Uh, It's where our vision keeps going. We reach wide to join on God's mission by sharing the gospel and demonstrating his love to our neighbors, to our city, and to the ends of the earth. That is straight ripped off from Acts 1.8. Where do I demonstrate? Where do I share? Acts 1.8. Jerusalem, to all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we just kind of contextualize that to our neighbors, our city, and to the ends of the earth. We didn't even, like, we didn't even try to change that one. What does that mean? Well, let me clarify, okay? When I say neighbors, I mean everyone in your sphere of influence. Every person in your sphere of influence. Where do you live? You have neighbors there. Where do you work? You have neighbors there. Where do you go to school? There are neighbors. Where do you play? There are neighbors. Where do you shop? There are neighbors. That is the context for you to share and demonstrate Christ's love. Jerusalem, your neighbors. Then your city. That's the next kind of iteration. Judea and Samaria, okay? The surrounding regions. So it's weird because we're in the burbs and there's like a billion little cities here. So, So Littleton, okay? And Highlands Ranch and Centennial and Lakewood and Inglewood and Parker, and Castle Rock, and Arvada, and Denver. And I made a joke about Aurora in the first one, but I'm not gonna make it about it in the second one because there's somebody in here from Aurora. But that's a city too that we should be sharing the gospel in. We gotta share and demonstrate in your city. Now, now how do you do, do you just like go downtown to 16th Street Mall with a sign? Maybe, but maybe not, okay? This is why we talk about local 
outreach opportunities, local missions opportunities. This is why we partner with local organizations. This is why we did Angel Tree and delivered gifts to all parts of our city, knocking on doors to demonstrate and share God's love to families whose parents are incarcerated. That's why we do local missions stuff is that we might demonstrate and share in our region and then to the ends of the earth, okay? So this might mean a missions trip. I mean, I think it's okay to go on a missions trip somewhere beyond this area, okay? Maybe that's to Thailand with us. Maybe that's somewhere else, TCU to the world. Go with a a group from your school. I don't know what that is. But it also, it doesn't mean that you have to have to go on some sort of trip. It could mean that any place that God burdens your heart for is a place that you start praying for and giving towards and and engaging with and learning more about. It's the ends of the earth. It's the very edge of uh, the the missionary front. We're invited to play there. We play in our backyard, we play in our city, and we play anywhere that the Lord might take us. That's joining on God's mission. That's the vision for Reach Wide. So, told you, one hour and three minutes, I'm doing all right. With the remainder of our time, the last bit of our time, uh, we've been talking at Fathom over the last couple of weeks, but really the last, I'd, I'd say the last six months, we've been talking a lot about kind of the growth that we've experienced as a church, right? We've, we, 30% of the church is new in the last year. I mean, this, it's, it's not like crazy growth, like, oh no, we got to, you know, buy a movie theater kind of growth, but it's growth that's bigger than we're used to as a small church. And we've been talking about new people. And tonight at the annual meeting, okay, I invite you again, come to the annual meeting tonight. We're going to talk about, do we need to add more services? Do we need to find a new facility? All of that stuff we're going to talk about tonight. Um, But as I've been engaging with people about this over the last few months, every once in a while, I'll have a conversation with somebody at the church who are kind of, they're kind of bumming out a little bit about the growth, it's kind of a little bit downtrodden about the growth and all the new people. And it's not because they don't love the new people, um, but, but, it, but it's because Fathom is changing. They, they, kind of, they just kind of bemoan the fact that this, this little church isn't quite as little as it was maybe when they first came. And like they miss it when we were smaller. And they felt like they, they knew everybody and they were all like in one room, fitting one service together. Um, and I don't want to like bash that, Okay. I'm not going to, because I do think that there is a good and right and healthy kind of mourning that comes with your church changing and growing. I think it's good and right and healthy um, because I remember like when we planted the church, I could literally call the entire church body, everybody in our entire church in two hours. I could call every one of you. And I did. I had one day set aside a couple hours that day where I would call every member of the church and just be like, hey, what's going on? Pastor Chris here, right? Mostly because I was lonely in my basement. But I would still, I would just call you and, and be like, hey, what's going on? Can I pray for you guys? What's happening? Is it, how's your kids? Let me follow up with that. Like those sorts of things. I would call and do that. And, and it was sweet. It was a sweet season. But we'll never get that back. I mean, unless we shrink down to 30 people, That ain't coming back, y'all. I don't have the time to call all of you. Some of you are really long talkers, okay? And I just, I can't. But I thought about it a little bit. I'm saddened by that experience not being here anymore, but it's also good and right to move past that. And it's kind of like watching children grow. Like Marcy and I will, uh, every once in a while, pull up our iPhoto or whatever on our phone and just like start scrolling back to the days when Harper was first born. And like we see this like, little lump of flesh that didn't sleep, that screamed a lot, and that evacuated her bowels frequently. Like that, that, and we were just like, oh, we loved her like in that infancy season. I mean, just, gosh, loved her. And in some weird way, there's like, I kind of wish she was that little still. And I enjoy sleeping now, right? So, so that season was sweet and it was good and it was right, but it was also good when it ended. And then we scroll a couple of years later and we see her toddling, you know, a toddler, two, three years old. And gosh, if those videos aren't so cute and hilarious that she's trying to say words that don't make any sense and gibberish and just so cute and adorable. And I love and miss those days, but I don't want to go back to t- changing diapers anymore. 
Like it was a great day when we got off of the pampers. You know what I'm saying? Like that's a good and right thing. Every stage of watching children grow is good and right and necessary. It is good when children grow up. It means they're maturing. It means, listen, they're healthy. Children who don't grow up physically, emotionally, it's an indication that there's something that's not as it should be. And that's okay too. But you have to wrestle with that at a different level. So it is good when your kid grows. And listen, the same is true when your church grows. Sure, mourn it. Lament a little bit that, hey, we're not just all packing into, like hopefully, listen, hopefully we're not in this room forever. I, I wanna get to a room where I can't even think about touching the ceilings. And it'll be, we'll, we'll be sad when we leave this place, but it'll be okay. It'll be good and right. So what I wanna do with the last minute is I, I, I didn't make this up. I've heard a number of pastors use this, but, but the reason why growth is good, the reason why we're talking about adding a service and talking about a new building, first of all, it's not because we wanna become a mega church. First of all, we're not that good. We're just not that talented. We're not that gifted. I mean, I look around here and I'm like, if we're using these gifts and talents, I'm not sure we're getting to mega church status, okay? Uh, but I, I mean this in jest. Like, that's not our agenda. I hope you can see that. I think you can tell when there's a church that's posturing to try and become mega and we ain't that, okay? So we're not looking to become a mega church, but we're talking about services and buildings and all of this stuff because here's the philosophy. Uh, we never want to stop making room for one more. That we, we never want to make, make, stop making room for one more person. The parable that I had read over us in Luke chapter 15, uh, we, we, I'm coming full circle to it. It's called the parable of the lost sheep. Okay, and in the parable, uh, it comes right before the parable of the prodigal son, if you're not familiar with that one. But the parable of the lost sheep tells the story of a man who had a hundred sheep. And of those hundred sheep, one of them goes astray. He loses one of the sheep. And so the man leaves the 99 on the hill and he goes to find the one sheep. And here's what Jesus says in Luke 15, five through seven, the end of that parable. And when the man has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. What that parable means is this. Jesus is about one more. He's about one more. He'll leave us to go find one more if he has to but he has now charged us to be in this same mission, on this same mission, to be about one more. And so that's what we're gonna be about. We're gonna be about one more. It's not about mega church. It's about making sure there's always gonna be another space for one more. And so my question for you this morning is this, who is your one more? Uh, 355 first time guests in 2023. 238 of them were personal invites. 76% of our guests were because you invited them. But I'm asking you, for 2024, who's your one more? Just one more. Gosh, we all have someone who we would do just about anything to get them in a relationship with Christ. Who's your one more? It's a like hundred of us or something in here. There's a hundred one mores in this place. Who is that for you? And so here's what I'd like for you to do. I'm serious. I want you to take the connect card. If you haven't already written on it, I want you to take your connect card and on the prayer side of it, I want you to write the name of your one more. Like I actually want you to do that right now. I would like you to take that card and I would like you to pick it up and the pen and I would like you to write the name of one more. One more person that you would like to see come to know Jesus. And I want you to write that, the name of that person on that card, or I guess you could put it in your phone or whatever, even though I've already just told you to pick up the card passive aggressively, but, but, but put, put the name down. And then here's what, I don't want you to leave the name. 
like on a chair because it'll get thrown away. I don't want you to put it in the giving box or like, I want you to put that name in your pocket. I want you to maybe slide that name in your Bible. I want you to maybe put that name like on the dashboard of your car like, or uh, tape it to your mirror or something like that. But I want you to, to start intentionally praying, not only for that person to hear the message of Christ, but for opportunities for you to be the person who might share and demonstrate God's love to that person. So I don't know, maybe bring this to school with you or bring this to work with you. If, if your one more is like a friend at work, maybe don't post that in your office or something like that. Hey, Chad, why is my name on a card in your office? Like, it's weird. Okay, just, you know, be a little more discreet. Or maybe that's the entry point that you want with them. And I say, go for that. But I'm just saying, like, I want you to start praying for our one more. I've got one more. I've got a one more who I've been praying for for years. Hasn't moved yet. I actually have a few one mores that I'm, that I'm praying for. But listen to me. We don't want to keep growing for the sake of growing. We want to be a church that never stops wanting one more. And listen, if you ever go to a church that doesn't want to make room for one more, I would tell you to leave that church immediately. We want one more person to come, one more person to hear the gospel, one more person to bow the knee to Christ, one more person to get in the baptismal waters, one more person to join us and go deep and reach wide. That's what we're about. And here's why, Here, here's why. Because at some point you were someone's one more. I was someone's one more. They may not have been able to verbalize it that way and you may not have even known that it was happening, but you were at some point someone's one more. Maybe it was a parent to a child and your parent, you were the one more they were praying for. Maybe it was a friend or a coworker or a neighbor, somebody who you were their one more. You were the one who they would do anything to get you in a relationship with Jesus. And you're sitting here today because you were someone's one more and so was I. I told you last week, I got saved in a church that I had done community service in after being arrested for shoplifting. I got saved in this church. And a couple years after I was doing the community service in this church, a friend in my school invited me to go with his youth group. Like I was, I was his one more. He invited me to go to this youth group and I was very much agnostic. I had no interest. I was not seeking God at all, but I went to church with this friend and unbeknownst to me, we pull up to the very church that I had been cleaning when I was doing my community service. I had no idea he went to that church and he invited me with him. I was his one more. And that same, uh, that same school year, a different friend of, of mine invited me to go to Young Life with him. I mean, I, I'm a freshman or sophomore in high school. He invites me to go to Young Life, which I didn't know what that was, but he said, it's like a Christian club that meets in my ba basement. Sounds like a cult. So I'm in. Okay. So I went with this guy and I get to this house and I go to his basement and there's a table with like brochures about Young Life. I pull one up, flip it over. And on the back, I noticed there was a picture of the president of Young Life at that time, a guy named Denny Rydberg. And I knew Denny. Like it was weird to see his picture there because I knew Denny because Denny was my basketball coach the year before that. So I, 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 I'm standing there in this basement hearing the message of the gospel and I start doing the math in my head. Like what are the chances that the place I did community service was the same church that I was later invited to? And what are the chances that my, uh, my basketball coach turns out to be the leader of a global ministry and now I'm in a basement seeing his picture on a pamphlet hearing that same gospel message? Theologically, there's a term for this. The theological term is uh, the effectual call of God. The effectual call of God. God was calling me. He was calling to me. He was wooing my heart and I didn't know it. I didn't know it. And the way that the effectual call of God was not an audible whispering of Jesus' voice in my ear or in my heart. The calling was through regular relationships with Christians. I was there one more. And they just invited me. This is the mission of God. And our mission is the same to see our one mores come to know him. So who is that? Seriously, on your card, who's that person? Is it a parent? Is it a child? Maybe it's your best friend. 
or a sibling. It could be a neighbor. It could be someone at work. Like, who is that person who you would do just about anything to get them before Jesus? Just hear me. We will always welcome them here. We will always make room for one more at Fathom. Even if we fill up two, three services. If we fill up three, four, if we fill up this building, get a new, we will always make room for one more. This is our vision. Fathom Church is a church where we go deep and reach wide. We go deep, we reach wide. That's our vision because that's what Jesus is about. He came to seek and save the lost. And he invites us to join him on that mission. So come back tonight for our meeting. I know it's business and budgets, but this is where the rubber meets the road for this for us this year, church. I love you guys. Let's pray together. Lord, we do bless you. Thank you for... Gosh, for the, the scriptures that we read today, for Acts chapter one, and, and that we, we get to be your witnesses. Thanks for inviting us into the mission that you have set forth since the beginning. And God, thank you for the parable of, of the lost sheep and the image of you leaving the 99 to go out and seek the one more. I pray that for, for, for the names of people that are that are on cards in our pockets or in our Bible or in our hands right now. I pray for the men and the women, the children that are named on those cards. God, I pray that 2024 would be a year where your effectual call would be heard by them through us. I pray that there would be people bowing the knee to you in the church, uh, being surrendering their lives to you fully to, uh, at the end of this year that are not in the kingdom right now because of this, because of the prayers, because of the demonstration, because of the sharing, because of all of these things, because of the mission that we get to join on. So Lord, we, we thank you that we get to be a part of what you're doing in your body, in your church. Empower us, Holy Spirit, to do these things. We need you. And so, Lord, we love you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, and all God's people said, amen.